adapt as they face political, cultural, and technological change. Watch Asia Insight on NHK World Japan. Watch NHK World Japan now over the air and on Comcast and Verizon. CCBC Continuing Education. Life enrichment. Indulge your creative side, whatever your age. Arts, hobbies, fitness, and world languages. Call 443-840-5200. Kilby Farms in Cecil County is a master energy recycler and sustainable model, creating on-site biogas with an anaerobic digester to fuel their efficient combined heat and power system. Learn about energy grants at energy.maryland.gov. The Johns Hopkins Alzheimer's Disease Research Center provides education and outreach on brain health and memory loss and conducts research on healthy aging, mild memory concerns, and dementia such as Alzheimer's disease. Visit allsresearch.org. The Chesapeake Bay Maritime Museum educates students about the history, environment, and culture of the Bay. From wooden boat building to on-the-water exploration, these hands-on learning experiences are available at the Chesapeake Bay Maritime Museum. State Circle is made by MPT to serve all of our diverse communities and is made possible by the generous support of our members. Thank you. Connecting Maryland. To their government. This is State Circle. Welcome to State Circle. Coming up tonight, new owners planning more cuts at the Baltimore Sun. We will take a look at the future of local newspapers. But first tonight, a controversial decision by Governor Hogan to roll back extra unemployment benefits. Nancy Yamada has the story. As a, a, a governor that has put forth the effort to be bipartisan, this is very, very disappointing. Senator Corey McRae says the Republican governor is hurting already struggling Marylanders by discontinuing enhanced pandemic federal unemployment benefits, an extra $300 a week. That ends on July 3rd. He says there are real consequences for families who are barely getting by. I'm talking about decisions whether you have food in your refrigerator, uh, whether you're able to pay your gas and electric is one of the things that you have to think about. Imagine Imagine if there are children in that home and that adult at that time is going through this situation. This is not very thoughtful. It's not very kind. But Governor Hogan says, quote, while these federal programs provided important temporary relief, vaccines and jobs are now in good supply. He believes ending the extra benefits will help address what he calls a critical problem, a severe worker shortage. On our latest jobs report at NFIB, we're showing that 44 percent of our members cannot find people to fill uh, their open positions. Mike O'Halloran is the state director for the National Federation of Independent Business, or NFIB. They're the same folks that are saying, look, our sales are improving. However, <laughs> we, we, we get to a certain point where if we don't have the workers to fill in these shifts, we don't have to worry about government closures. We're going to have to close because we don't have the folks to sell these goods or you know, produce these wares. And starting July 3rd, the state will reinstate standard requirements for anyone seeking unemployment benefits to show proof that they are looking for a job. Senator McCray points out not everyone is ready to go back to work given their compromised health, fears, or child care situation. We need to make sure that we put health and safety first versus making a buck. He joined lawmakers from the Baltimore City Senate delegation in a written appeal to the governor. They say every option will be explored as they vow to fight for the extra benefits to continue. We're talking with the attorney general's office to see what measures can be taken as a legislative standpoint. I know that the Senate president has also exhausted the opportunity to be able to say to the governor, hey, July 3rd has not taken place at this moment, and you do have the ability to reverse the decision that you've put out there into the public. I'm Nancy Yamada for State Circle. Joining us now for the Annapolis Faceoff, Delegate Luke Klippinger, Democrat from Baltimore City, Chair of the Judiciary Committee. Also, Delegate Nick Kipke, a Republican from Anne Arundel County. Thanks to uh, both of you for joining us. Delegate Kipke, if I can begin with you, Larry Hogan as governor for the last six and a half years has shown an incredible knack for doing the politically astute thing. Did he make a mistake on this unemployment issue? No, he did what is abs absolutely right and essential. You know, so many people, and I noticed there was a protest today of people mad that 
The governor is moving to end the $300 bonus through unemployment uh, in a month from now. Uh, but at that protest, there were a lot of young, able-bodied people. Uh, and uh, frankly, those young, able-bodied people uh, need to get back to work. There's a huge demand for employees at every level. Uh, I, I hear it from, you know, you, you think about restaurant workers because that's, you know, th the folks that are they're loudest about this, but manufacturing uh, jobs uh, throughout the region, cyber jobs, retail jobs, uh, bio research jobs, you know, it's, you know, uh, Dr. Fauci recently said that within the next month or so, the, uh, the pandemic is going to be officially over. So I think people need to have a mind shift as to where we, we are right now. Uh, it's time to get back to work. Uh, never before in history has uh, unemployment given an additional uh, bonus of, of any a dollar amount, much less $300 a week, which was a very generous benefit. Uh, it was essential throughout the time where in, employers were required to stay closed. Uh, but now those employers are desperate to get op uh, open and running and get those employees back. And let's, uh, listen, there is something very moral. There is something very valuable about work. It's, it's, a, it's an aspect of dignity. People who are unemployment, uh, statistics show, have an enormous amount of depression and, and unhappiness. It's, it's time to get back to work. Delegate Kleppinger, how do you see it? I think that the governor did make a mistake, and I, I, it's something that the leadership here in the, in the House and the Senate are taking a close look at. We're asking Attorney General Frosch to look at. Um, that extra $300 is still very, very important for, for families across the state who are still struggling and who are still facing challenges as we uh, come out of this pandemic. We still have a challenge with people who are facing eviction, for example. And that money is important for helping people stay in houses, keep the lights on, and, and get their legs under them as we recover. This has been an uneven recovery to be sure. And we need to be making sure that we do what we need to do to uh, support those, uh, those families. So we're gonna make sure that, that uh, uh, we're, we're asking the attorney general to see what we can do to, to see if we can overturn uh, what the governor's uh, done and try and get that money back from the federal government. Uh, to Gen be Gentlemen, let me let me um, zoom in on on that point. Are are these federal dollars that we're talking about? And separate discussion to be had about the wisdom of federal uh, fiscal and monetary policy. They're they're borrowing, they're printing a lot of money these days. But was any of this coming out of the state treasury? Well, this was all federal money, and and uh, we're basically sending it back to to Washington, um, and I, I don't think that that's a good idea here. Again, there are a lot of families uh, who need it. Um, I will say, you know, to to your your question about you know fiscal policy on the on the federal level, we seem to care about that a little bit more when a Democrat is in the White House than when a Republican's in the White House. Uh, but having said that, I think I think here the money is there. The money is needed by people across the state and we shouldn't be sending it back. So Delegate Kipke, if, if this program is gonna end in a couple of months anyway, and it's all federal money, what's the harm in passing it through to people who are unemployed? Well, uh, they don't have to be unemployed and it's a great American value uh, to have a sense of dignity uh, by having a job and those jobs are available and for people to be unnecessarily incentivized by the government to stay home and make money by not doing anything, I think is, is, is not, it's not good for them. It's not good for our economy. It's not good for our culture. Additionally, you know, while I have great respect for the chairman of the Judiciary Committee, I, I do disagree. There is an enormous amount of federal money that is available for rental, rental assistance. People should not be facing eviction. There, that has flown through the state at great numbers. The money's available. There's plenty of additional programs out there for people who are desperately in need. But the bottom line is there's an enormous amount of people, people that I know who are, who are currently sitting uh, at home being paid more in some cases than they, they would make uh, previously at work. Uh, however, you know, uh, the jobs are there. And, the, and look, the vaccine is readily available for Marylanders. Uh, and, uh, you know, these businesses have, have been through a lot over the last years. These are mom and pop businesses uh, up to big corporations. And we need to get going again. And there's real, it's morally irresponsible to sit at home when you are able to go and get a job. 
Delegate Klippinger, let me ask you about that. Is it true that there are people who are making more money not working than they were working? And, and your thoughts on the, the, the moral aspect of, of work? I think that we have a moral responsibility to help those people who are in need. And that's why the extra money is very important right now. And I do believe that they're in need. When you're talking about people who are are making with the $300 on top per week, you could be making four or $500, maybe $600 uh, a, a week. I, I, generally speaking, it doesn't may not get even that high. I mean, you're talking about at this point, jobs that are, if they were 40 hour a week jobs, they're, they're $10 an hour, $10 an hour, $11 an hour jobs. It, it's not like we're, we're paying people $100,000 a year. Uh, on unemployment, we're paying them enough to just get by. And so that, to me, I think it, it, it makes it uh, morally responsible to continue those payments. What about the, the aspect of this where ordinarily people on unemployment are required to document that they're looking for work each week? That's been suspended. Um, I think either the governor's decision reinstates it or it was about to be reinstated anyway. Well, uh, part of the problem is our unemployment system is overrun with fraud and all kinds of problems. And it's making people who really have needed unemployment over the last year, it's made it very difficult and frustrating. And anytime you tinker around with the system and change it, it, uh, it creates more roadblocks. Uh, and what I think most people will tell you is the biggest incentive to get back to work is ending this extra $300 a week. Think about it, $300 a week, $1,200 a month. It's a lot of money. And this isn't, you know, uh, you know, some might try to spin it that this is for, you know, uh, people who um, uh, are, you know, without it are somehow gonna go uh, without. The, the fact of the matter is that the jobs are there and available and it's safe to return to work. This legislature met uh, for 90 days when it was less safe, when, you know, the, the Maryland's population has re received an enormous number of vaccines, uh, where it's one of the best uh, vaccination uptick rates in the country. And, you know, COVID is nearly vanishing in this state. It's still there. People still need to be aware of it and take it seriously, but the, 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 the it's safe to get back to work and uh, people need to realize that and keeping them a, a away from their jobs is, is just, it's just not good for them and it's not good for anything. I think yeah, like a Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, I think that, that, you know, there are a lot of things that we've done in the legislature here in this last session, though, that that can help sort of resolve the, uh, the backlog and resolve some of the problems uh, that have uh, been out there with uh, with fraud. We put uh, more money in for staff to, to help uh, resolve and process unemployment claims in this last in this last legislature. I'll, I'll tell you, you know, one of the big challenges for all every delegate on both sides of sides of the aisle, certainly for the last year, have been the hundreds and thousands of calls we received from our constituents who have had challenges navigating the, un the unemployment system. And the Department of Labor really has, has struggled to get up to the task to, to handle these things. We Gentlemen, I, I'm, I'm down to a minute. So I, I wanted to give both of you just 30 seconds, a couple of sentences. The governor's announced his final veto decisions on this year's legislation. What, what stands out for you? Well, I'll just say the governor has continued to be sort of a centrist governor. He's uh, he vetoed a lot of bills that would have made Maryland more of a sanctuary state. He vetoed a lot of bills that would have driven up the cost of energy in our state. You know, he's he's very aware of the everyday issues that Marylanders are facing as it relates to crime, uh, affordable uh, housing, uh, cost of living. Maryland is one of the highest tax states in our country, and this legislature continues to pass bills that makes that problem worse. And he's taking a stand for Marylanders uh, and for taxpayers. I've been, uh, was very disappointed with the, the, the range of different vetoes that, uh, that, that he uh, handed down here over the last, last couple of weeks. I'll, I'll tell you that uh, even on a bill that was pretty well bipartisan that would support commercial tenants commercial tenants from uh, and help them if they they were being subject to eviction protecting their own personal assets uh, in cases uh, related to eviction he vetoed a bill that that I, that had support on both sides of the sides of the aisle there very disappointed with that and I, I think that that was the theme that I I was very disappointed about as he has sometimes tried to burnish those centrist credentials there were a lot of bipartisan bills that he vetoed Elliot's Klippinger and uh, Kipke, appreciate the time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.
Maryland's largest newspaper, the Baltimore Sun, now owned by a controversial private equity firm, Alden Global Capital is best known for aggressive cost cutting. How will this affect readers? We talked about it with NPR media reporter David Folkenflik and Penny Muse Abernathy, visiting professor at Northwestern University's Medill School of Journalism. Thanks to both of you for joining us. David, you had reported on a Maryland entrepreneur's efforts to purchase the Sun and turn it into a nonprofit. As of our taping time, that doesn't seem to be happening. I think he still holds out hope from what I hear uh, that that may be possible. He needs Alden to, you know, to agree to that. And it's really uh, balls in their court and, and it's their decision to make. Uh, that said, my understanding is he is making good on his promise to plan for a not-for-profit news site in the absence of the ability to acquire the Sun so that he could essentially compete with uh, the Alden-owned Baltimore Sun. It would be, if he's willing to put as much money behind it as he claims, I believe some tens of millions of dollars over time, uh, that could be a substantial addition to the Baltimore news ecosystem for sure. Penny, based on your research, is there a future for the local newspaper business? It has obviously been a, a tough couple of decades. Right. Well, there's definitely a future for local news. There's a need for folk, local news. I mean, I think one way to think about it is that local newspapers especially have been instrumental in both nurturing our democracy at the national and uh, community level. Uh, but also, too, in kind of building community. So there is a need for the function that newspapers have provided for our democracy, to say nothing else. Uh, a lot of my research has shown that there is a future. It depends on the market and it depends on the owner. What happened to the newspaper business? It used to be the Sunday paper. You virtually needed a forklift to, to get it home. Two things happened. The internet happened. It shifted a lot of the revenue that had sustained good local uh, news gathering, particularly print advertising, over to the internet. And then, of course, we had 2008, which ex uh, accelerated the loss of uh, newspapers that had taken on debt to buy other newspapers just before uh, the recession hit. And we, we had a group of a uh, new group of owners rush in private equity, hedge fund, investment entities, and they bought, bought the distressed newspapers and began to manage them and operate them as businesses, not as public trust. But, but part of the way they're doing that is shrinking the newsroom. I mean, David, that's the, that's the MO of the, the group that now owns Tribune. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the number one, I think, way in which they save money is by head count. Uh, they've already, in many cases, reduced the number of days that they print the paper. Printing the paper still uh, is a huge cost. And yet, you know, print editions bring in for local newspapers far more advertising dollars uh, and subscriber dollars than digital subscriptions and digital advertising do. So they're still reliant upon it. Uh, they've already, in many cases, sold off the real estate. Uh, or at least the valuable real estate that were attached to these newspaper properties. So you're really seeing, you know, what my old editor at the Baltimore Sun, John Carroll, uh, used to call the harvesting strategy of just sort of pulling out organ after organ uh, and selling them off for parts uh, in a way that in many, in many markets, not all, uh, has been deeply detrimental to the ambitions and the achievements of the journalism that they can provide to the, to the citizens of those regions. I read that the, the Sun at one point had as many as 400 reporters. They're down to about 80. Uh, the new owner is offering buyouts. So presumably that's going to keep shrinking to 60 and maybe 50. Is, is that something, uh, a question for either of you, is it something that the public is going to notice? Because certainly a small town newspaper can run successfully with, with a very small number of reporters. Well, it depends on how you define de success. And I want to defer to to Professor uh, Abernathy in a moment, but let me say this, Alden says it wants to find a sustainable model for local newspapering and wants to keep them in business, but it wants to keep them in business to do what? Primarily, it seems to provide revenue uh, for, and, and increased profit for Alden to subsidize other more speculative investments 
uh, the chief content officer of Tribune Publishing, the sort of parent company of the Baltimore Sun that was just acquired by this hedge fund based in New York, uh, told the staffers of the Chicago Tribune that the Tribune company newspapers, the Baltimore Sun and its sister papers, were making about 10 to 13 percent profit margins at the time of its act uh, uh, earlier this year, and that Alden wanted to push that north of 20 percent. So Alden wasn't coming in and saying, look, we can make money and consolidate and save costs. They, they're saying, we want to increase profits on what are already deeply constrained uh, objects. And Alden has tried very hard to test the outer limits of how much they can cut back and, and really um, uh, wildly reduce the headcount in these newsrooms and have people still willing, enough people still willing to pay for print subscriptions to leave them those profit margins. And it, it's almost like a science experiment for them in, in what's you know, called uh, price uh, elasticity. Can they get away with it if, you know, if you're continuing to diminish the product they're giving and still charge you a chunk of change for it? And I think that's not the way to approach newspaper business if you're looking for a sustainable model that also provides people with the kinds of information they need to act as citizens and as a check on public officials and private actors. Well, and, and Professor, to, to the eyes of, of a consumer, it's still going to look like the same newspaper. It's going to have stories, it's going to have photos, it's going to have ads. The Baltimore Sun here just won a Pulitzer for reporting uh, that landed the, the then mayor of Baltimore in, in jail for corruption. That may be the sort of thing that, that is lost at the margins. Oh, absolutely. I think there are two ways to track the loss of news over the last decade. One is the loss of actual uh, newspapers by the merger into larger newspapers or just the shuttering of newspapers. So think about the Annapolis paper and the, what it has done and how it has uh, approached uh, covering the state of uh, Maryland as well as the community where it's located, merged basically into the Baltimore Sun uh, and another way to think about that is the loss of journalists. I mean, you can cite the Pulitzers that are won, but how many Pulitzers have gone unwritten because there was no one to do that? There's just simply no way as committed as journalists are. And I have nothing but the highest admiration for the journalists who are still in it, trying to overcome all these resources. There's just no way for them to cover the stories they would have in a 400 person newsroom as they now have it in 80 or 100. Something goes by the wayside. And Jeff, let me just, just build on that a little bit. Uh, you know, there are two things to think about. One is that uh, the kinds of reporting that lead to the Pulitzer that you talk about, which was tremendous and, and just astonishing to read from afar, uh, is done in spite of rather than because of the ownership and the kinds of management you have. And the previous ownership, Tribune Publishing, uh, in a numerous iterations, failed its, uh, its newsrooms and its readers as well. Uh, the second thing to say is you can have almost constant headcount and keep driving out people with experience and, and uh, certain kinds of institutional knowledge of their cities and the, the kinds of places that they cover and hire younger people to come in. And we need infusions of young people coming at this with different perspectives to enter journalism. But when you have a critical mass that is so pared down and you lose people who understand how Baltimore city politics work, how the state of Maryland is at play, what the suburbs of Washington are versus those the, that ring Baltimore city, uh, you lose a lot and you overlook a lot. And when you have copy editors in Chicago, uh, not knowing that something spelled Blair actually should be Bel Air, you know, road, you're losing something real for the citizens of, of, of Maryland. And I think that that's, we're already at that point. And the question is whether you go down so low that even if uh, the bodies are there, the knowledge has to be built from fresh. It's almost as though you're wiping away the memory. And that's a problem because newspapers are our collective sense of cohesion, our sense of, uh, uh, of uh, accountability, but also a collective sense of memory as well. Penny, you, you've written about the, these new models, whether they're nonprofit or they're small entrepreneurial journalism ventures. Does it all add up to the same thing? David, I think about the world from the, the standpoint of the, uh, the press room in the basement of the Maryland State House where you have been. There is still the Washington Post there. There's still the Baltimore Sun, maybe fewer people. There's still some regional papers. Maybe they're not there as often. There's the, the legal paper, the business paper, the AP. There, there still seems to be a nucleus of journalism. And added on to that, you have a couple of these nonprofit startups. 
Well, and I think Baltimore is blessed to have those things and reporters from the University of Maryland Journalism School who are there as well. Uh, I think it's blessed to have those things. But, you know, I tell you, back in 2009, I did a story for NPR where I imagined what would it be if a newspaper evaporated and just disappeared? What would happen next? And I, I took as just the test case, the Hartford Current. They, for obvious reasons, didn't want to participate in the story. But I walked the halls of, uh, of the Capitol in Hartford, Connecticut. And you know, there were, there's a huge, very similar kind of newsroom. And, you know, you had the, 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 the mail pack chin high, you know, for, for all these places, but it was a ghost town. The New York times had abandoned it. The Boston globe was not there. Major newspapers could no longer afford to send people there, except when there were significant events, uh, you know, and you talk to the TV stations around town and they said, we need, we have, you know, it's the largest city, you know, one of the largest cities in Connecticut. So they have new TV stations there, but we need the newspaper to direct our attention, know us, show us where to go digging a lot of the time. And I think that these are, have been the, the, the engines that fuel journalism, the horsepower that drives it. And I think that Annapolis is lucky to have it. And yet it's not covered the way it would be if the sun were to be at, at full strength or even half the size it was when I was there and have all the complementary beats that could surround with expertise, the political reporters who are just trying to grind out what the heck's happening in subcommittee and what's likely to get passed on the floor. Like you need that knowledge. You need that, that sort of complementar com complementary uh, uh, knowledge and assurance that you know what it is you're writing about so that not everything is treated like horse trading and politics, but that we also understand policy implications and what our lives are gonna look like for the citizens of the state. And Penny, your perspective on that and, and whether the startups can help. Well, I think there are two ways to look at it. One, when you lose your local newspaper, you invariably lose the reporter who shows up at the town council meeting, the county commissioner meeting. When you lose the reporters on at the Baltimore Sun, a state level um, newspaper, what you're also losing are the people that, as David mentioned, cover the important beats, education, environment, produce those analytical contextual stories as well as investigative pieces. So, you know, I think we need to think about whether startups can, what role they can actually play. I mean, one of the issues is that we've lost so many, half of all newspaper reporters, there is just no way overnight to compensate for that. So where can you make the most um, uh, impact is it through looking at those beats that you've lost and, and creating um, uh, news sites that can cover those beats effectively? Is it at looking at what is missing on the local level? So I think it's going to take entrepreneurs who look very carefully at what the resources are in the uh, community, what the needs of the community are, and kind of match that either in a nonprofit, for-profit, or a hybrid model. Penny Abernathy, David Folkenflick, thank you both for your time. Thank you. you bet. Our thanks to David Falkenflick and Penny Abernathy. And thank you for watching State Circle. Have a good night. This program was made by MPT to serve all of our diverse communities. University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science. Leading the way on Chesapeake Bay restoration while guiding our state, nation, and world toward a more sustainable future. For more than 60 years, Meals on Wheels of Central Maryland has delivered nutritious meals and connection to our aging and homebound neighbors. Volunteers are needed to deliver meals. Visit MealsOnWheelsMD.org. Are you a Maryland renter at risk of being evicted due to COVID-19 related